Welcome to the Born Unbreakable podcast. I'm your host, Coach Des, mindset motivator and lifestyle entrepreneur. From lost trauma, disappointments, and devastation to healing hope and betterment, what has grounded me is my unbreakable spirit. We all have that spirit within us. Every week, I'm here to inspire you with stories of perseverance and growth. My mission is to help you crush self-limiting beliefs and to be unapologetically you. You are your only limit, so take action today. Let your unbreakable ride begin now. This episode is brought to you by Blue Skies Life, a lifestyle brand with high quality, ethical, and sustainable products. There are products for your mind, body, and home, everything from calming tea and luxurious shea butter to Turkish towels and silk kimonos. The holiday season is upon us, so start getting these one-of-a-kind gifts now. Go to blueskieslife.com, that's B-L-U-S-K-Y-S, L-I-F-E dot com and use code BU20 to get 20% off your order today. Welcome to the Born Unbreakable podcast. We're here with a very exciting episode today with my guest, Andrea Medina. We are going to spend a good amount of time talking about her latest project, which is her book. We'll get into that, but let me take a moment to introduce her. She's a Mexican-American language enthusiast, meditation and journaling practitioner, a writer, and a huge rap fanatic. She is looking to pursue her master's degree in counseling psychology. She has her BA in international relations and literature from Claremont McKenna College. And like I mentioned, the book we're going to talk about today is The Energized Self, A Journey to Interconnected Healing. It comes out this winter 2021. I'll let her talk more about that. But this is a really unique project because not only is it about Andrea's personal journey, which we'll get into shortly, but the themes of the book are ones that many of you listening can relate to. And it also is a story about 22 strangers. And that's what's so cool about it. It's almost a mosaic, if you will, of different uh, experiences and challenges that people have gone through. Uh, Everything from you know, trauma and maybe abuse, different relationship type of challenges, identity questions that people have. And what I love about it is these individuals come from different backgrounds, uh, different upbringings, different experiences and walks of life. And in that though is the commonality of struggle and needing to go on this exploration to find themselves. And I I can say with confidence that if you're tuning in, you chose this podcast because you care about yourself and you care about self-development and you at some point in time, or maybe even now, are questioning aspects of who you are and maybe who you want to become. So that's why I'm so excited to have you here today. Thank you on the show i'm so happy to be here thank you for having me and i I was telling andrea i was so uh, proud today (laughs) to be mexico jacket um in honor of uh obviously her being a latina but also because i happen to have a very special love in my Mm. heart for my (laughs) so a little bit the celebration today but you know i think the very first most important question that i need to ask you is uh who are some of your favorite rappers? <laughs> you know what's funny? Um, my introduction for my book actually starts talking about rap. And I mentioned that I've always been obsessed with Eminem. Um, since I was, I don't know, eight years old, nine years old, I would listen to his songs. And the thing that spoke to me about rap and still speaks to me about rap is that it tells some of the most lasting stories about topics like you know addiction crime um losing like your children to addictions as we've said or any other like poverty um it talks about loyalty talks about depression issues that 
growing up, I didn't really have an expression, a way of expressing them if it wasn't through hearing this, these songs from artists that would just pour their hearts into, you know, five minutes of music. And in those five minutes, I learned the, their entire life story and the way that they came into who they are. And in a way, that kind of concept of storytelling through rap, it transferred again into my life you know, years later when I interviewed people for my book. And that's been one of the coolest things to see that kind of full circle, but definitely Eminem. Um, I'm listening a lot recently to NF, um, another artist that, you know, uses a lot of storytelling in his music. But yeah. <laughs> I love it. Taking us back to 8 Mile. 8 movie. Mile. <laughs> what a good movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm to watch that one again soon. But yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Rap is is such an amazing way to understand the, well, like a lot of what we're gonna spend time talking about today, challenges that people have and, and it's an art form, yes. really. You know, I, I love people, I love hearing people use that as a platform to share more about who they are and, and what they believe in. Uh, but I wanna hear more about your story Mm -hmm. So obviously there is a, a landscape and a backdrop to, to leading up to the book that you wrote with so much heart and, you know, so much of your personal experience. So what is a little more about your own uh, life journey and experience? Yeah, um, my life journey has really been impacted by my parents. Um, I grew up with a parent that just recently, I learned a father that you would call narcissistic. So it's a parent that places their own interests, you know, above the interests of their family, of their children, of their uh, spouse. And my dad was very much like that growing up for, you know, up to when I was 15. Um, he left the home when I was 15 voluntarily. You know, nothing really, we, we always wanted him to leave because there was both verbal and emotional abuse um, at home. But, you know, my father was very much always wanted his words to be the last spoken. So we weren't really able to, you know, convince him to leave until he decided to do so on his own. And growing up, I was kind of used this expression in my book that we walked on eggshells, my family and I, for years, where we were afraid to say anything that would elicit an outburst of anger, of frustration from him. And the funny thing, and I've actually, I recommend, you know, your listeners to see this show on Netflix that actually just came out, I think last week. And my mom and I were watching it together and it's called uh, Made and it's based on a memoir um, also. And it talks about emotional and verbal abuse. And in the show, what I love about the show is that it makes it very clear that sometimes victims of this kind of abuse do not think that they're being abused because it's not physical. They don't see a physical sign of it. And they therefore assume that, you know, it's, it's okay to be in that situation. But the truth is that I took a really long time to call what I went through abuse because I thought the category is too extreme, you know, for what I went through for those years. But when I looked at the psychological damage years later and the way that I struggle to love myself and struggle to accept love from others it was clear to me that it was just as strong as you know physical abuse you know they're both and i think the category is not what gives it its meaning but the weight it has on the victim and it should be that way um but yeah that's that's what i grew up with and the show makes that very clear so i recommend your listeners you know check that out and for my mom when she was seeing the show you know she was crying because she real she saw herself reflected in the stories of uh, the story of this woman that her husband emotionally abused her and she went to you know uh, you know social services to get help and they said well we can't do anything because you know you're not being you physically abused but uh growing up that was my situation and i think you know i repressed a lot of memories uh, I, I recently read that trauma, our brains have this way of repressing traumatic memories. So they don't hurt us once the trauma is over. And that's what I've been trying. Like every time I get triggered by something that, rem that reminds me of my childhood, I will start recovering these memories. But a lot of them are hazy 
um, you know, foggy because of the, the hurt of them. But in my book, you know, when I've written about them, they've been the couple of memories that I have been able to recover. And it was difficult because it was an, a constant, you know, feeling of not being able to express myself growing up. Um, my father also called me stupid a lot of times. So it was kind of not believing that I was worthy due to those insults. And yeah, kind of my journey after that was a lot of repressing those memories. And, you know, I went through high school, through college. College were kind of the years that I started realizing a lot of my unhealth unhealthy ways of coping with the memories. And through doing a lot of, you know, self you know, internal work, I was able to start uncovering that abuse and working through it. Um, but if, do you have any questions? I've just been <laughs> rambling about, about this. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's so vulnerable for you to be able to share something personal, especially when it, when you carry that history, the pain attached to it, and to then see your father actually leave what what did you feel like at that time when he left when you were 15 yeah i was i felt like i was finally able to breathe um what i say in my book is that you know when my father left we were so desperate to be able to have the ability to just have a di dinner where we weren't afraid of you know him having an outburst and it ruining our entire time together as a family that we had like genuine laughter when he left and just being able to be in the home and and joke about something or just, you know, like walk away whenever we weren't comfortable or we just wanted our alone time. Like finally we had that independence and I really like held on to that when he left. And I mean, I didn't question the fact that he had caused so much damage for those years that he was just suddenly able to walk away like without anything, any repercussions. Um, I never questioned that because I was just happy to be able to have my family back and have time with my mom, with my brothers. And it was until years later when I realized that my self-esteem was super low. My self-worth was, you know, I didn't even know who I was. I, I had always abided by um, an identity of achieving in school, of just using that achievement to bring some form of stability to my life. I thought, you know, if I do good in school, then you know, my father will be proud of me or just, you know, will say less things that were hurtful because I never even knew how my dad saw me. I still don't know how he sees me. We never had conversations where, you know, a, what, like I think a parent would have with their child where they would, you know, either validate, validate what they're doing or just really appreciate their unique personality um, like I had with my mom. But with him, they weren't, they were non-existent. And I had that kind of realization later on in life when I was in college um, and I was noticing where I was hurting myself. And I say this in my book that I kind of took up uh, my father's abuse towards myself in those years where I was really just keeping my voice, you know, as quiet as possible. I was going about things in my school where I didn't want people to to see me as stupid. I was in a very like elite college. I grew up in a in a household that was low income. I'm still, you know, my family is still low income. Um, my mom didn't study until she only studied until the third grade. Um, my father also until fifth grade. So it was always those so societal aspects and social aspects, and also the abuse that kind of compiled and made me feel like, you know, my voice wasn't worthy in any way. And yeah, when he left. Um, I didn't question the abuse until much later. It was more so just happy to be liberated in that moment. Yeah, and that, that word is so powerful, liberation, mm -hmm. you know, because that is, it captivates um, what it felt like for you that during that whole time where it was, it, it was more almost like an imprisonment you know, of, of not being able to be yourself and, and a confident version of yourself. And so I'm curious, you know, because you, you did, you use the word depression and you talked about kind of taking on even the beliefs that, of the words that he told you, what did you have to do 
to change your mindset in a different direction to, to recognize your own energy and your own power. Yeah, um, I the time span for kind of that realization, I was in college and I was probably was the, the hardest year I had in, in school because I was accused of academic dishonesty um, during that year. And in college, that's a very serious accusation. Um, and when that happened, you know, it kind of was like a fallout of a lot of feelings that I already had in me that I was not worthy of being at that school and that I don't know like I just felt like you know all this all this time up till now like my identity has been built against the backbone of achievement in school and then all of a sudden you know I'm I'm being called a cheater and you know my integrity is being questioned and when that happened I just I mean I broke down I was telling my mom like I'm sorry you worked your entire life for me to have this you know, opportunity to go to the school and to make a better li life for myself. And I just threw all of that away with this mistake. And, you know, she was very supportive. I ended up coming out of that. And, you know, in my book, I mentioned, you know, I, I wrote a letter to my academic advisor, which, you know, he was the one that kind of guided me through being at that school. And he was very supportive. And I felt like I disappointed him. And I, I got the strength to, you know, write that letter and explain to him what was going on in, in my mind. And, but when that happened, I was still thinking of that um, when I came back home from university. And it was during the pandemic, so fairly recently, you know, I came back and I was dealing with that. I was also dealing with friendships that I wasn't really happy with, but I was in those friendships because I didn't think that I kind of deserved better or that I, and also in a relationship that I didn't think I deserved better. So I kind of stuck with, with those partnerships because I just, they were comfortable. Um, at the time. And when I came back home, I noticed that, you know, our family had not addressed at all the trauma that we'd been through for those years. And it was very visible because all of a sudden I could see in my brothers, you know, the way that they carried a lot of the coping mechanisms that I carried. And I was, that was just shocking to me. And, you know, it was just all of that compiling during the, the year that I was home. And I did fall into a depression. Um, I was just very negative, like I used very negative self-talk. Um, I would wake up every day almost at noon because I wanted to experience as little of the day as possible. Um, I just, I started thinking back to my childhood and I, I, it was my first time ever, you know, trying to really grapple with those memories and understand them. And I have had many nights where I was just, I would drink, I would, I would drink alcohol and I would just go to bed, you know, to feel as little as I could. It would be like numbing for me to be able to do that. Um, I remember I hid alcohol from my mom. Like she didn't know that I was drinking as much as, you know, she, she saw that I was drinking more because I would even in social events. But besides that, I was also drinking, you know, hiding it from her. And I didn't want to be like that the entire time that I was doing that. I was critical of myself, too. I was thinking, you know, this if I keep going down this path, you know, I it's not going to fit what I've always wanted for myself. Because even with the abuse and the difficult life circumstances, you know, I always had dreams and I had aspirations to, to write. I had aspirations to express myself. You know, I would write to my father. He never read anything that I wrote. Um, he would just toss it aside and take um, any other physical gift that I would give him, like, you know, something that he could, like chocolates or something else. When I was little, he would just take that and leave whatever I would write aside. Um, and that was hurtful. You know, it was one of those things where you start expressing yourself and you realize you don't have an audience for that expression and, you know, you kind of just shun it, shun it down. Um, but you know, I had that period where I was very depressed and the way that I came out of it was really through just changing my physical environment because I think that I was, you know, there's this quote that when you change your external environment, you could change your internal um, world. And I never understood what it meant until I forced myself to be in a situation where I was constantly having an intake of just positivity because I was so negative during that time. And I started waking up very early, like super early. Like I don't wake up at that time anymore because it's funny. I don't feel like I need that anymore to be positive. But at the time I needed it. I needed that like schedule, that routine to be able to get back to who I knew I could be. So I would wake up at six every day. 
I would, you know, go outside, I would listen to motivational videos, to podcasts, like, you know, your own, that were inspirational, that were stories of people like me. And I would think if they're doing it, then, you know, they, they've been through worse than I've been through. So what is, you know, keeping me, now I see that my story is just as, you know, uh, worthy as theirs of, of being, you know, worked through and, and um, getting better. But at the time I was having that comparison like you know if they're doing it I could do it as well and I would have that I would also just journal journaling was huge for me because it was my first way of expressing myself after all of those years and it was just for me it was expression for me but when I read it it was like having I don't know just validation that my feelings were there and they were the experiences that I lived through were valid and that was just instrumental for for that growth the journaling aspect and it was just those things like it was really things that I did I went to therapy as well during the time but I couldn't afford therapy after four sessions so I ended up having to quit therapy and that was kind of at first another reason to drink I won't lie that I didn't relapse into drinking again but you know after that I it was just this feeling in me like you know you can't stay stuck in this because it's just gonna get worse and I would go back again to trying another thing. I tried like meditation as well. And you know, the way that I meditate, I still say this to this day, meditation does not look a certain way. Like you don't have to be spiritual or have been a certain like a lotus pose and be meditating to be meditating. You can be listening to music that empowers you and just be with yourself for a moment instead of being there for others you know, just listening to others, you're just with your thoughts for a second. And for me, that's what meditation has always been. And I tried that then and it worked. And slowly, I started just having a more, um, not yet a positive outlook, because I was still fairly disillusioned. But I started thinking about things differently, like reframing my past, you know, understanding that I had been through something difficult. And then all of a sudden, I had the opportunity to write the book. Um, I was I was writing a memoir um, because, like I said, I've always loved writing. And I started writing it, and I got stuck. I was I was thinking, well, I don't have really anything to say after you know, like eight chapters that I'd written. I was like, I feel like I haven't lived enough to yet write a full book about myself. And then at the time, a friend from college reached out, and she told me that this like publishing company was looking for people that were interested in writing a book and i thought this is crazy like i i was just writing my memoir and i stopped writing it like two weeks ago and this opportunity is coming up and then i you know took it up and it was very quick i actually signed up on the last day available to sign up for the for the cohort um i found out about that like a month after starting to write and that was just insane but yeah that's so insane <laughs> I just want to call out, uh, first of all, and not the acknowledgement of how difficult it is to, to take that turn because staying stuck is easy to do and, and making conscientious choices like waking up early, listening to motivational videos, doing meditation is, is, is effort, you know, because you want a different result and you took the initiative to do that. But it's almost like, through that and the process of you writing the universe conspired to this moment mm -hmm. the publishing company the timing of that and the validation that your story is meant to be heard it's meant to be heard but beyond that it's meant to help people through these difficult times where it doesn't feel like there's a light. Mm -hmm. Just it feels very dark. And so it, it really brings me to my next question, which is how did you choose the 22 people as you started getting deeper into the process of saying, okay, I'm writing a book, I'm doing this, I've got some content because I've written eight chapters of my own memoir. What gave you the, the concept of interviewing other people yeah it was honestly i didn't choose them i think they came into my life in the same way that you're saying the universe conspired it kind of happened in that way as well 
um, I thought I had this idea and it was crazy because my, my publishing company told me they were, they asked me one morning, um, who are you interviewing for your book? And I thought interviewing, I thought I was going to write a memoir. I thought memoirs are meant to be about my story. I didn't know that, you know, other people's stories also had to be addressed in, in my own narrative. And I thought that I was just being ignorant about the writing process. So I went ahead and reached out to people. I reached out to a lot of people that I knew through social media and just also in my, my daily life that I knew that might have a story to share about inner peace and just, you know, personal development, mindfulness. And none of them got back to me. You know, they were, they didn't want to be interviewed. Some of them had bigger platforms. Um, I don't know if that, you know, had something to do with, with it. I followed up. Um, but no, none of them got back. And I was disillusioned. I thought, well, I guess, you know, that I'm not meant to do this project again, because if I didn't have those people, I couldn't, according to my publishing company, you know, really have that validation, not validation, that reinforcement of my own um, points that I made of my story. So then one day I just thought, what if I reached out to people that are that have been part of this publishing company's journey and also that are still, you know, in it where they're trying to publish or they're friends of people that are trying to publish. And it's this big, big, like, um, group of people. I think there are over 800 people in that, in that um, kind of cohort. And I just emailed all of them. Like, it was like a mass message email. I don't know. They have this chat where you could, you know, reach out to them. And I was just kind of like, it was those moments where you just do it and you don't expect anything out of it. But I messaged them and I actually didn't even want to get a response because I, I was scared. I, I like shut down my laptop and I'm like, I don't, I don't care at this point. Like it is whatever it is. And my phone was still on. So it was connected to the, to the app. And I got so many messages that I was blown away, like from people that were just saying, I read about your topic and I just, I just have this thing that I want to share. And I've always wanted to share with someone, but you know, I've never had the opportunity to. I was a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of people that reached out. I was still in my undergrad, my last year of undergrad. I was working on thesis at the time. I had a lot of things on my plate. Um, and I was very worried that I would slack in school while doing this. But I just booked a whole bunch of meetings with these people. I had meetings back to back most days. Um, I would I would tell my mom, I'd be like, oh, I have a new meeting coming up. And I just added it to my calendar. And I'm sorry if I'm going to, because our house is fairly small. So I was worried that it would disturb her. But I had a lot of meetings for like a month, like back to back. And it was just meeting people that I, strangers, basically. I would have a conversation with them for one hour. And they would open up about, the deepest topics about their life and they would be so vulnerable and it was just it was like a therapy session almost because every time they would finish talking they would say you know i i don't know like i feel like i've always wanted to to share my story but now that i've done it it feel it feels like it's helped me understand who i've been until now it was the weirdest thing that they felt that well i also felt it even though i didn't like know them and their stories were very different from my own. I resonated with feelings that they had, a frustration of loneliness. You know, I was still going through feeling alone, through feeling depressed. And when I heard those stories, I just, I felt like I was part of something bigger than myself. And I mentioned this in my book too, that I actually, I was still going through what I mentioned, the period that was very dark. And I showed up to one of my interviews um, hungover because I had just drunk the night, uh, drank the night before. And when the person started talking about their story, it immediately, you know, shook me from whatever point I was in where I felt in a pit and I couldn't get out of that pit because he talked about a moment in his life where he considered taking away his life. And he was talking about, you know, what led up to that. And I was just shaken from that moment of woe is me. And I listened to what he had to say. And, you know, I, I was just focused on being my best self to be able to hold space for him. Because I'm like, he's being vulnerable with me right now. I can't, you know, be bring my kind of problems that I'm having. But at the same time, when he shared that, and when I wrote his story for my book, I was able to see those similarities between the feelings that I was experiencing on his own, even when I wasn't taken to that a verge of considering uh, suicide but yeah it was kind of like that how they came into being interviewed
That is amazing. It's incredible because there was such reciprocity in that experience with you learning to have these stories accentuate some of the things that you want to share in your book, but holding space and giving them, in many cases, a first platform mm -hmm. to really share something that they've been holding on to in their hearts and in their life, yeah. which, which is really like taking a weight mm -hmm. off, off of somebody's shoulders. Because for, for the, the kind of things that you were connecting with these individuals on, uh, it, it felt heavy, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of it that you, that you share. So uh, obviously, you know, we, we want people to, to get the book when, when it comes out. But if you could share, what are some of the things as you take a step back and you think about the different individuals what are some of the biggest things that you learned from doing um, this? I learned that we are more powerful than we think we are because a lot of these individuals ended up working through their difficult like traumas and just circumstances where they really lost faith. I had so many, that was kind of an overarching theme, people that lost faith in what they could do for themselves in you know points where it seemed that the world was against them or that just whatever they could do would not be enough to fill the voids that they were feeling within. And the way that they turned that around was just identifying the unique um, little things of life that worked for them. I had a person that I interviewed, um, she ended up actually connecting one morning with nature in the weirdest of ways. Like she went for a run and she ended up seeing deer, a flock of deer that were around her when she was running in the snow. And she had just gone through the craziest period in her life, through a divorce, through breast cancer scares. She had just lost her grandmother. Um, her daughter had moved away from home and she was left alone with, you know, grappling with the effects of a divorce after her husband cheated on her after 27 years of being married. And she was feeling in this very, very low place and she went for a run and she had this connection with nature and with something bigger than her situation at the time. And for her being in that moment, it brought her peace, even though everything else was falling apart around her. And for someone else, that might not bring them peace in a circumstance like that. You know, I, I know that. But in that moment, I tell these stories of what brought her peace because it, it pushes someone to see in their life when they look around at this moment, what can they hold on to to give them that peace to be able to do more for themselves? Because it's going to look different for everybody. And something I feel um, in our current society dealing with mental health is that we kind of place so much value on these assured solutions like therapy. This therapy is a great resource. I don't, you know, put it down in any way, but it's not the only resource. If you cannot afford therapy, if you cannot, you know, get yourself to have someone listen, listen to you in the moment that you're going through a very, very rough patch in your life. You know, I, if I would have stopped at the point where I got denied therapy, you know, I wouldn't be writing this book. I wouldn't be doing, I wouldn't be talking to you, Des. And I looked for things that worked for me. And that's what the people in this book have done. You know, they have searched like up and down, you know, they have messed up in, in some of their searches and gone through tools that really weren't for them. But the point is that they kept searching and they still are, you know, I had people that told me I still haven't found inner peace and they're open about that. And when I, when I had someone tell me that in my interview, I questioned whether I had found inner peace. And the truth is that I haven't, you know, there are still moments where I use, like, I use very negative language towards myself. That's still something I'm working through, but I try to get as much, you know, motivation and inspiration from other people. Storytelling for me is huge for for healing and for growth and this book was all about storytelling you know people were sharing their stories and for me it was like little therapy sessions as well every time I would speak to them and music has been huge for healing for me as well you know I mentioned this rap in the beginning rap has always been when I grew up one of the only things I had to feel understood and 
it's understanding those things how you know it's not always the big concepts like therapy like that are the only choice you know you have other choices and the people in this book have really made that clear and how the answers are really within them a lot of the time when they search for them externally um i i've been like that with my journey you know i've always searched for things externally in relationships in validation for accomplishments and you name it but at the end of the day i was not fulfilled with those things because i was still I still had unresolved trauma that I was not addressing. I wasn't holding the space for myself that I was holding for other people to be vulnerable. You know, I expected myself to be this hard person that went about life, you know, just accomplishing and at the end of the day, you know, feeling like she had done something because people told her she had done something, but she felt empty. And really, um, I turned 22 actually like, like a month ago. And I told my mom that it has been the happiest I've felt in all of my birthdays. And it is because I feel my internal state matches how I show up in the world for the first time. I feel like I'm expressing myself. And people can turn 40, can turn 50 and come to that realization because it's, you know, one thing my editor told me when writing this book was, um, people are gonna look at you and are gonna look at how young you are and they're gonna doubt, can she really talk about trauma? You know, cause she's so young. And what I say in my book and my author's note is that healing is not measured in time you know you cannot you know people can go into their 30s 40s and still have coping mechanisms that are born from unresolved trauma and just refusing to look at the pain that they've gone through growing up or just you know in in their daily lives even and when they don't address it they neglect really themselves and the people in this book really made it a, a priority to to prioritize themselves and to really care for them and that, that has been one of the most refreshing things to notice from the people that I've interviewed. Yeah, I, and I'm, I'm really glad that you just said a couple of the things that you mentioned. One being, there's not a silver bullet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is not one silver bullet where we wake up and take a special pill and all of a sudden our life is transformed into this whole new, new life. And there's good days and bad days. Mm -hmm. There's ups and there's downs. And I, and, and I think I appreciate that because life is messy yeah. like that and imperfect. And there's times when you learn and grow. And there's times when you just want to stay in bed all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's where you're at. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think we take all of it in the moments of growth, yeah. the moments of, of a little bit of sadness, you know, and, and it's really, I, I, a lot of it is self-awareness is acknowledging yourself, being okay with it and, and knowing that it's going to take a lot of different ways of support, uh, and exploration, I think, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, finding that, hey, you can have a moment in nature when it feels like everything is falling apart mm -hmm. around you and have a sense of peace. You don't know sometimes until you just take a different road yes. what can happen. And so it's that giving yourself a chance to just try different things to see what works for you. And I, I think that's what's so beautiful about what you've said is it, it's not a prescription, mm -hmm. you know, of just do this one thing and, and everything is gonna change overnight. Um, talk about your, how your relationship has evolved with your family. So mm -hmm. I know that there's a challenge of your father leaving, but how is it today with your mom? And mm -hmm. then you mentioned brothers. Yeah, I feel like me writing this book has been healing to me, but also to them um, because I've started to, like in my book, I actually mentioned um, the way my relationship with my siblings changed. I had, I had this resentment towards my older brother. Uh, well, they're both older, but like the oldest brother that I have, um, where I, when my father left, I looked up to him to be the role model, my next like paternal role model that I wanted to feel understood by and validated by. And when he started um, getting into a relationship and in a way neglecting that I was there, um, because he started living his own life 
separate from me. I started feeling that resentment that I felt towards my father, towards him. And I wasn't being at all understanding or trying to be understanding of the trauma that he had also undergone. And when I started kind of realizing that, that we were, we went through the same situation, like the same trauma. And a lot of times this happens with families that go through difficult upbringings. They go through the same thing, but they internalize it differently. They show it differently to the world. And my brother, um, he was going through a lot of things that I didn't know he went through when we were growing up. Um, he was listening to conversations that my father had with other women. You know, my father had multiple affairs and I never knew about this growing up. He did and, and he had like an anxiety attack when we were growing up too where he was gonna leave the home because he just couldn't take it anymore. I didn't find out about that either until recently. And just r holding that compassion for him has been huge for me because I no longer, you know, react from that resentment and that feeling like I'm not validated. I had this script in my mind where whenever those behaviors showed up, I would just say, you know, I'm not worthy, I'm not validated, then I must not be important. And that just kept ringing in my mind every time behaviors that my father exhibited were reflected by somebody else, even in a romantic relationship. And when I started being mindful of those things and I held compassion for my brother, we started having more heartfelt conversations. We had one where you know, it was out of the blue, but he ended up basically saying that he felt guilty for all of the moments that he wasn't there for me like he wanted to be. But he felt like he was being pulled in all directions, trying to be a good romantic partner, trying to be a good son, trying to be a good brother, while at the same time struggling to understand who he was and where he was headed in life while trying to maintain this masculine image of, you know, being, being able to be self-reliant. And our culture, our Hispanic culture, really makes it difficult on top of being masculine to show your emotions and to be vulnerable. He wasn't able to do, do that. My father really, really emphasized that aspect of, you know, being a masculine, you cannot show your emotions. And really telling that to my brothers and just, you know, showing them that it was okay for them to, to cry, to just show what they were feeling, the frustration, the anger, has been very, very good for our growth as a family and our healing as a family. I mean, I won't say everything is perfect. You know, there are still things that I wish that I could share with them that sometimes I feel I can't just because in the space that they're in right now, I feel they have to go through some of that um, inner kind of exploration by themselves first before we can have conversations about topics like, you know, the re relationships and just accepting love romantically. I feel like I've wanted to speak to them about that, but it's something that I, I feel with therapy, you know, one of them is taking therapy now. Um, they might be able to be coming into that more into being more open about those things before I can speak to them. With my mom, um, you know, my mom just yesterday, um, actually my mom was diagnosed with cancer um, this year. So it's been a little bit hard in that area. I was with her two days ago, we were at the hospital and she was getting like a checkup and in the, the room, the hospital room, she started talking about the abuse that she underwent before I was even born with my father. And it, it was, I don't even know how we came to speak about that, but she was very open about it and she'd never been that open about it before. But since she's found out that I'm writing a book um, that mentions you know, the abuse, she just felt like she needed to get it off her chest. And we were in this waiting room. We were both crying, waiting for the doctor to come in. But, you know, she was just saying things that, that about me too, um, as well, when I grew up that I didn't remember about the way that I had gone through the abuse. And, you know, and we also had a conversation, and I mentioned this also in my book, where, you know, we talked about the way that she didn't feel worthy either. She felt like she wasn't going to ever get the opportunity to get love again. She just, her self-esteem was in shambles due to my father as well. She still heard his voice every time she remembered him telling her, you're never going to succeed, telling him, telling her all of the possible foul words that you can think of because my father just found a way to, to say those and to her. And she still remembered every single piece of it. Well, I had blocked a lot of those memories and you know, just her being able to open up about that. I told her in that conversation 
how much I looked up to her and how I saw her and how I knew that other people saw her worth. And just seeing her face, seeing her breakdown, you know, in tears really just made me see how much she needed to hear that and and how deprived of it she was growing up as well as we we were deprived of it. Um, but yeah, it's been healing in that sense. And, you know, I love my family. I, I say this that, you know, my father really, he made a decision for himself, but he lost such, you know, uh, just such beauty in being able to be with other people that love him and that care for him. And I feel bad for him about that. Like now I'm starting to refrain things. Like I actually feel bad that he won't ever get to experience that unconditional love from a family. And I'm so grateful to have that with my brothers, with my mom, that looking at him now, um, I won't say that there is no longer a misunderstanding and resentment for just what was in his mind when he did a lot of those things growing up. But at the same time, I mean, I feel I feel like I don't I don't wish that upon anyone to end up alone without their loved ones, because that's some, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that um, it's difficult to understand the actions of other individuals sometimes, especially those that you love, especially your family members. Mm -hmm. And with time and maturity and understanding, you come to recognize that behaviors are a projection of the self, mm -hmm. not of others. And so for your father, he's on his own journey and he's still on that today. And we, we can't predict where that will lead him tomorrow. And if, if maybe that journey will lead him back to a different place of understanding you, your mom, your brothers, but nonetheless, I think the journey you've been on is one definitely, like you said, of healing, but I think it's, it's also demonstrating that there is beauty through the pain and your vulnerability has enabled and evoked that vulnerability of your family members, of you being able to do that to one another. Mm -hmm. Because even within our own families, we wear a mask often. Yes. And culturally, those masks can be worn to protect ourselves, to not have to face certain things. And then the buildup uh, happens where at some point you can break and you have to, you know, uh, allow yourself to express the, the true, the true feelings that you have. And I think that is mm -hmm. the point at which you can work through things like resentment, like you said, mm -hmm. you know, you can only turn the corner if you, you face what is, is causing that feeling. Yeah. And for you to be the younger sibling, I think that your, your older brothers have, learned a lot you know from you and and truly the community around you and your mom has got to be so proud <laughs> i mean of, of everything you've done especially the work that it takes to to take something and to and turn that pain into power mm. and and to perseverance um i just i, I really commend that and i mean i i was so moved when I learned about you and your story, but hearing you, it, it puts me into a whole nother level of, of, of just in, inspiration by everything that you've done and, and, you're, and you being so raw about the, the process, process that you're still in. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that it's, there's not an ending. There's not. To our Growth. You know, sometimes it feels like there's there's going to be this epic moment mm -hmm. where all of a sudden we reach this mountaintop and we're omnipotent and and we just get to carry the torch. And it's not really like that. It's, it's this continuous staircase. Mm -hmm. And I think along the staircase, there's just these pivotal moments that allow us to learn. But there's still more steps. Yes. Right? There's not an ending to to where we we get to it's just the the progression of our own expansive uh, ability to perceive mm -hmm. different things 
and, and understand ourselves. But I want to be able to say, what, so now people are like, I have to read this book. <laughs> really powerful. Uh, tell us how we can uh, get a copy when it comes out in the winter. Yeah, of course. Um, the best resource is really my website. Um, it's www.authorandreamedina.com. And currently I have the link to the uh, pre-sale for the book, but since the pre-sale was over in September, yeah, <laughs> um, unfortunately you can't pre-order it now. But when it comes out in December, there's actually a deal that's happening with Amazon where you can get your copy um, for a dollar, really your Kindle copy, your online version. And it's going to be going on for the month of January. So in the last week of December, you know, the book is going to be available in Amazon. And then you'll be able to purchase it for a dollar until February. And yeah, and then afterwards, it's going to be available on Amazon, also in um, Goodreads. You could buy it there. And also, yeah, you could see any other updates for the availability in my website, which is the best place to, to go to. This is so, this is so exciting. I, I I feel so blessed to have been the universe bringing us together in this time because I can't tell you enough how much your work is needed. Just just to know that there's stories that people can connect to and relate with that are real, that are raw, that help us to realize that we're not alone in the challenges that we face and 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 that it is it's okay to to go through these things and know that you're in good company with people that that are just trying their best yes. as well to, mm -hmm. to become versions of themselves but i want to shift into a couple of questions that will help my audience get to know you even more <laughs> and uh, the first one is uh, what are three words that best describe you hmm. That's a good question. I, um, I would say, it's. I would say a phoenix. I don't know if you know, like the phoenix. Um, you know the idea of rising from ashes. But the thing I that calls to me about the phoenix is that there's constant reinvention in a phoenix, and I feel like that's kind of what I've been going through, and that I've come to peace with. That, like you said, the journey of healing and the journey of growing is just never ending. You're constantly unveiling layers and and identities that you didn't even know you had. So I guess Phoenix um, or reinvention, either or. Um, I don't know, em empathetic. I feel like I, I love empathizing with, with other people. I love hearing people. That's why I went into counseling. And I don't know, um, vulnerable. <laughs> I've never had a problem being vulnerable. <laughs> that we can attest to all right here, right now. <laughs> To you. There's so much like strength and vulnerability that I feel I've, I've tried to tell this to my brothers, you know, and it's hard because you grow up with patterns of thinking that you believe vulnerability is a sign of weakness. But I feel the strongest when I'm vulnerable because I feel that I, I really I'm just being truthful. And I feel a lot of times in this society, it's very, like you said, very easy to hide behind a mask. And that's the easy part. You know, the hard part is when you get out of out of that that mask and and doing the work is so fulfilling and yeah yeah to be it's to be emotionally naked mm -hmm. right it's that feeling of oh oh my gosh you know, <laughs> makeup on right now or you know yeah. it's that sensation of you're 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 in your realest most raw moments but that that right there is when humanity comes together mm -hmm. right because what we see, and I think this is really interesting, what we see on the news, which I don't like the news, so <laughs> I try to get information from you know, the positive sources and still try to understand what's going on in the world, but is very divisive. Mm -hmm. It's all, always pointing out what makes us, what makes us different. You know, there's Democrats and there's Republicans, there's left and there's right. There's, you know, all of these things mm -hmm. that make you pick you know, you're this or that, it's black or it's white. Nothing is ever black and white. Mm -hmm. Nothing in life is, is, is like that, you know? And um, I, I, I think that being vulnerable is showing that gray space. Yes, you said it beautifully. Yes. Depth, 
that complexity of who we are as human beings. We're not just one thing. Mm -hmm. we're not, you know, it's we're so much more than that. And and that's why I think the power of vulnerability is just it's it's so tremendous. Mm -hmm. you know? And emotions are also not black and white. You know, forgiveness is not black and white either. It's one of the biggest yeah. things I've learned recently. But yeah, you said yeah. it beautifully, you know, that that gray space is what we don't see a lot of, you know, also society loves boxes and loves categories to make sense mm -hmm. of things. You know, that the category of trauma of the, the term abuse, you know, they love also putting a definition to that. And, you know, sometimes victims that are undergoing abuse, you know, they think they're not because the category, it's the definition of the category does not fit in with what they're experiencing. But at the end of the day, like you said, the gray area is where our humanity lies. It's not really those, yeah. those categories. I know. Like, when are we going to be able to check a box mm -hmm. that is like mixed or, right. you know, mm -hmm. like everything is either, you know, you're, you know, yeah. just one thing. And it's, it gets confusing when <laughs> you start trying to check, like, well, oh, I guess I have to pick one, right? So mm -hmm. you just pick the one that it seems the most. But, but, um, yeah, it's it, life is just so much, so much more complex than that. All right. My next question for you is what's one thing that you're working on improving? Mm -hmm. The biggest thing I'm working on improving is my self compassion. Um, I'm so hard on myself still, you know, and at the end of my book, actually, I mentioned the, the last chapter is about um, the work of healing and the work of growing and develop developing is led by self-compassion and just uh, there are many moments where i would look at you know one of those days like you said where you feel like lying in bed all day um and i would be so hard on myself for that i would forget entirely the good things that i did for myself that entire week prior to that and you know it, it never hit me how much i have actually grown in my way of thinking until i read my journal entries of of just months ago years ago that I, I had this moment with myself where I was actually proud. I was like, I'm actually proud of you. Like, it's insane to say this because it feels like very odd to say positive things to myself after self-hate and just negativity have felt like my normal. Um, but just, I've been working on rewiring those thought patterns and being my best friend and being my best companion before I go in search of a romantic relationship, a friendship to fulfill me. You know, I want to show up as someone that feels fulfilled within to be able to give that love to others that is more authentic. But if it is taken away from me to know that I still have something to return to that can really hold me and not make me feel like I don't want to be with myself. Because that's something that, you know, it's the biggest weakness and detriment to, to what I can do for my life when I don't feel comfortable with myself. Andrea, I wish that I could have heard those words, everything you said when I was 16, 18, 21, 25, every day. I mean, it's so, so magnificently powerful. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm blown away at, at that level of, of just recognition of how important it is to build this relationship with yourself and not self-sabotage mm -hmm. and have uh, those moments where you you can't even look in the mirror mm -hmm. because you're you're not proud or you're so hard on yourself um and the fact that you can can go through that process and reflect on your growth through your journal entries is is really such an amazing thing mm -hmm. because it takes it takes it takes a lot of work to to be able to, to start thinking of yourself differently yeah. and it and it's consistent work it's very consistent work that you have to do to be able to adopt that mindset. So um, that might be the part that gets played over and over in all, all, all the cars across the, across the world. Like, hold on, let me rewind that. And I need to say that to myself every day in the morning. <laughs> no, and it's such a, like, I know that I'm going to be working on this for a long time. When you said you would say that to your 16-year-old self, your 25-year-old self, you know, I know I'm going to be, like committing to this for a lifetime it's something that is such a big undertaking but at the same time it's so simple you know you would think it's simple to rewire your thought patterns and to be your best friend 
um, because it just leads more naturally to other things, to interacting with other people. But at the same time, when you've grown up conditioned to see yourself differently and, and to pinpoint your flaws and, and self-sabotage, you know, it's so hard to make that commitment. And I've had a lot of moments where, you know, I, I fall off of, of that commitment and I start reverting back to how I used to think of me. But it's just knowing how, how big of a difference it's going to make in my life. I keep going back to it because I don't want to let go of that. And I know it's going to, it's going to change me for the better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> okay. My next question is what is a self limiting belief that you've had that you've had to overcome? Mm, self limiting. Um, that I needed somebody else. I mean, it goes back to the same thing that we were just talking about that I needed a romantic relationship. Actually, that was something that was very big. I thought I thought that was the missing piece in my life, to be able to love me and to be able to be vulnerable. Um, and I really played by that limiting belief for a long time because I got into relationships that I wasn't happy in. But I, I just thought, you know, they were comfortable and I was able to just ignore everything else that was going on that I that was uncomfortable for me to face so that that belief that I wasn't going to be fulfilled until I had somebody else you know it was it was limiting the growth that I could experience outside of a connection with someone that was not authentic and that was just there to to fill a void um but yeah I mean that and also just believing that my voice was not worthy in, in any way and that I didn't have anything of value to share that was different from what was already being shared um, in the world. That was also another big limiting belief for me. If I was doing a survey right now, like a live, if this, if this, you know, if, if people could tune in live and, and like click a survey of how many people have thought this, like Andrea, everybody would be pushing, you know, the yes button. Uh, <laughs> As it, as it relates to relationships, feeling like we need to have some sort of companion in order to complete ourselves, you know, feeling like we're, we're not worthy because there, there isn't this, this, this other half. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's another big important lesson in life that we have to learn. I was just interviewed on a podcast yesterday and I was talking about this exact thing our wholeness, our wholeness comes from ourselves. Mm -hmm. We fill our cup up with what makes us who we are, how we walk in the world, mm -hmm. what we believe, how we show up. That's our responsibility. It's not for someone to come in and make us whole and make us complete. Mm -hmm and make us a person that's worthy. Only we can do that. But I think that lesson takes a long time <laughs> to, okay. to own, you know, to really own and to, to believe. Mm -hmm. Because um, if, if, if anyone is listening and you've ever had your heart broken, it's really hard <laughs> mm -hmm. to, 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 to go through the pain and anguish of heartbreak and believe that you're worthy. Mm -hmm. Like those things don't really live nicely together, right? Like right. The, the heartbreak and the belief that you're worthy is difficult mm -hmm. to share in that in that space. So I'm really glad that you you opened up about that that self limiting belief. That's Thank very you. potent. <laughs> um, okay, what what is one thing? that you want to see changed in the world? Hmm. I would want, and I mentioned this also in, in the podcast that I just interviewed for, I think it was like a week ago, but it touches upon something I already briefly mentioned, that I wish that mental health and the focus on mental health started to be taken off a little bit off of the, the unreachable point that it is now where people feel that they have to go to great lengths to be able to prioritize their mental well-being and their emotions they feel they need to like I said wait until they see a therapist or just they have this idea that 
kind of society portrays where there must be an external source that is there to welcome you for you to be able to be vulnerable and share your emotions and work through your traumas when the power to do so and and the initiative is always within you and i wish more people um really portrayed that idea in in our society to let you know that you know you know yourself better than a therapist can know you than anyone can really um get to to work through your your inner um turmoil and really just letting people know that they have that power and that ability to be self-reliant, but at the same time know that when they start being self-aware and they start working through that, then they can know what they want to reach out to for help. Like they know what they want. Like I reached out to podcasts and, you know, these motivational videos um, and not a therapist, but at the same time, you know, I just started taking therapy um, two weeks ago. So I also am using this resource, but I'm using it when I tune into my own needs and what my reality is instead of letting you know somebody else dictate how i should start addressing my mental well-being and my emotions i don't know if that makes sense but i just feel like you know just bringing the power back to the individual is so important in our society in our world but i also know what we have just been talking about that our world loves categories our world loves you know forming boxes and it's hard yeah. to show that in the gray area is where you can find a lot of your personal power um, unfortunately, you know, our society does not really like to show that as often as the latter. Imagine, imagine a world mm -hmm. where we all took that personal power and owned that. It, it, we would live in a different place. We would live, uh, and that's the point of this podcast of being born unbreakable is being unapologetically you, mm -hmm. not who other people want you to be, not what society tells you to be, but the you that you find mm -hmm. that makes you get to be whole and happy and joyful and peaceful and content. But there's so much noise. Yeah. There's just so much noise. So being able to find that, it seems like this construct that's easy to do, but it's not because there's so much disruption. Mm -hmm. There's so much disruption. And so to, to be on a path, you have to be steadfast in yeah. finding yourself. And, and I think it's uh, incredible that you've done that for yourself or on that journey. And then you've, you've inspired others, you know, through the work, through the work that you're doing with your book. Okay. What is one of the best pieces of advice that you've ever been given? Hmm. I actually, this makes me a little emotional. And I, in my book, I, I mentioned this, um, the person that gave me this advice, he passed on, but he was my middle school counselor. And I remember it because it was, he was like a father figure to me at the time. Um, he was kind of always the person that saw the best in me when I had a hard time seeing it. And one, one day, you know, I had just gotten rejected from, I'll just give a little bit of background for the advice because it was, you know, I had gotten rejected from this private high school that I applied to. And I was I lived in Compton at the time. And, you know, the city is not seen as favorably by, you know, this. I was in Palos Verdes for this school. So it was a more wealthy region. And I scored fairly low on my stay nine scores. And I had just gotten rejected. And I basically complained to my counselor. I told him, why did you allow me to apply to this if you knew that I was going to be rejected? I said, you know, I made my mom drive me there and she almost got fired from her job because of the situation. And basically what he said was along the lines of, you know, would you have preferred to have not undergone this and have lost the lesson that you just gained from it? You know, like what I look at it now is, you know, when you go through difficult things in life, you know, you kind of wish that they had never occurred, but you gained a lesson from them. And the question he asked me that day was, would you prefer to have lost that lesson that you now hold and that you now have learned so much from and you've been enriched by, you know, to have let go of the experience? And I've, I've turned that into how I see what I've been through growing up with my father. You know, would I have really let go of those years to have lost what I think of now about myself and, and just relationships and how I'm growing into the person that I want to be? I don't think I would let go of that because it's just, you know, who I am today is so, so rooted in that, but at the same time, it's so different because all I focus on is rising from that. And 
and I wouldn't have gotten that fire to do that from without the experience. So that's, I don't know, and I hope <laughs> your listeners, if they're going through difficult things, they know that, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they know that, you know, the experience might be extremely challenging and extremely, you know, taxing, but at the end of the day, you're going to learn something that, that you're going to really not learn any other way. And it's kind of sad that, you know, the, the difficult things have to occur, but you just get enriched by them at the, in the long term. Yeah. And sometimes we, we don't appreciate those moments. Mm -hmm. We appreciate them all the moments where we're winning, right? Where we get to celebrate. I got into the school, you know, I, those, those, mm -hmm. it's, it, when you're when you didn't get in or things didn't go your way you're not happy about that yeah <laughs> he's absolutely right he's absolutely right i mean you you wouldn't take back the experiences that you've had because we not we might not be having this conversation right now if it wasn't mm -hmm. for them you might not have written your book if it wasn't for them you know, I mean, there's there's a culmination of things that bring you to a place at the right place at the right time for the right reasons. And I truly believe that that's how this has all happened mm -hmm. today. And for the person that's listening right now, they're meant to listen to this right now at the time and the space that they're in or where they're at in their life. This is here as a gift for them to hear and to get something from big or small, you know, of, of anything that resonated in the conversation that we've had. Andrea, where can people follow you? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, my Instagram is the main like social media platform that I use. So it'll just be Andrea Medina underscore author. And yeah. And my website as well, which I mentioned earlier. That is amazing. This has been the highlight of my day. I'm so honored to be able to have this space and to have this conversation with you. I feel so inspired and I'm confident that anybody tuning in feels the same way. So I just really thank you for taking the time to share your story and to share this amazing piece of work that we'll get to enjoy soon. Thank you so much. You're so sweet. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I'm, I'm excited to follow your journey. Mm -hmm. And then have a discussion with you after your book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we'll have, to, we'll have to do part two soon. I love that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Andrea Medina, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, such an accurate description of her character and her perseverance. Such an inspiring interview vulnerability, bravery, courage, the energized self, her book. I cannot wait to read it and I cannot wait for you to go out and read it. So speaking of the energized self, this is my ask of you today. What do you need to do to energize yourself? There's not a silver bullet. What you did yesterday might be different than what you need to do today. It's progress, it's a journey, but give yourself that space. Whether it's being in nature, meditating, journaling, taking a bath, giving time to yourself to reflect and to appreciate where you are right now today. It's not about yesterday. It's not about tomorrow. It's about right now. We're on a journey and sometimes taking a purposeful pause and appreciating where we've come in this very moment is what we need to do. We move too quickly through life and move on to the next thing and embracing the, the, the journey that we've been on, the growth that we've experienced in such an important part of life. So take that time today.
take that time. Thank you for being here. I hope that you are enjoying listening to two episodes a week of the Board Unbreakable podcast. Give a rating and review if you haven't already. Make sure you hit the subscribe button if this is the first time that you're tuning into the show. And remember that you are your only limit. So take action today and I'll see you again on the next episode.